Hi, everybody. Meredith Baker for On the Map, Off the Radar. I'm here in Helsinki with Fadumo Daib, who um, it's a huge honor to have her. She's actually running for president of Somalia. She's been in Finland for 26 years after coming here as a refugee from Somalia, has gotten her master's here, recently got her master's at Harvard Kennedy School, worked for the UN, and now will be going back to Somalia for the presidential elections. So first off, best of luck for that. And thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. I know you're very busy. Thank you for the opportunity. And could you start by saying how your personal journey growing up and working so hard to get your education has kind of influenced your decision to run for president of Somalia? Actually, my advocacy and campaign is premised on my personal narrative, on my story. My story is the story of almost 12 million Somalis. I think each and every Somali can empathize, they can sympathize, they um, can understand what I'm speaking about because that's the reality that they live in. And so it's a story, it's a collective struggle mm -hmm. that we all face. And so when, when I am running for office, um, a lot of people actually see that it is them running for office, that I represent them. Um, I am the voice of the voiceless. And so they see that as a milestone, uh, as, as um, hope, a new beginning for Somalia. And they are very optimistic that should we have democratic elections, uh, people like me, my chances of getting into office would be very, very high. And so I don't often talk about my presidency or the, the, the candidacy or mm -hmm. you know, what I'm planning to do or what my political platform is. I speak about the fact that we are lacking education, we lack healthcare, we lack security, you know, the basic human rights, and we're not able to meet even our basic human needs. And, and so we want a new start. We want to do things differently. And I don't know if that actually answers your, your question, but um, my objective is to initiate social change. I'm talking about work that will take years, if not decades and centuries. I'm the catalyst. I call myself a catalyst. I'm the one who opens this door. Many others will rush through it and they will carry the work. We will not see the results in a few years. But we have started the war, right. the struggle for emancipation, the struggle for democracy, the struggle for a better, prosperous Somalia. And my daughters, their daughters will take on this role. And um, on that note, uh, as a woman hoping to affect change in a typically male-dominated society, what have been some of the main challenges that you faced in trying to advocate for this change and how have you worked to overcome this? I've understood from a very um, early age that this world is a male-dominated world, not just Somalia, not just my society, not just my culture. It is, unfortunately, a global world that is highly male-dominated. And I've come to understand that this is something that is unjust, particularly because majority of the inhabitants in this earth happen to be women right. and their children. But I'm also very optimistic that times are changing and the world will have a new order whereby women will be the leaders. We are already seeing that in Britain, we are seeing, we saw that in Germany, we saw that um, in, in Liberia, we, we saw that in Mauritius, Mauritania and other parts of the, of the world. We saw that in Pakistan, Bangladesh. I, I am very optimistic that in, in a decade's time, majority of, I would say, or most of the countries would have human leadership. And so the struggle is not really just one that is in Somalia. It's one that is in Africa, um, but that is also global. And that's how I see it. Mm -hmm. 
And in my society, the way I've decided to struggle or, or to challenge that is mm -hmm. by stepping forward. We have a saying in my language, a woman's place is either at home or in a grave. Mm -hmm. I am negotiating an existence that is in the middle. And that is my own, right. uh, based on my own definition and, uh, you know, on my own expectations and negotiations and not because a man happens to say that that is the way it should be. And so by doing that, I'm putting myself at risk and, and, and I understand that, but I'm of the opinion that a coward dies a thousand deaths. We've died so many, many times. The time has come for us to really step forward and say enough is enough. We will not allow 1% of the society to dictate to 99%. And so I understand stepping forward is not about just me. It's about challenging harmful traditional practices, culture, you know, uh, the misinterpretation of religion and many other things. And so my existence is a threat to a lot of males in my society who just by the mere fact of even living and breathing is uh, you know, a, a very big threat to, to them. But we are not going to negotiate our existence any longer. That time has, has gone. We are going to take our rightful place in society and we are doing it. It sounds like regardless of the outcome of the presidential election, you've already won in that regard in inspiring young girls in Somalia and elsewhere that they too can set their sights on things and work to achieve these and affect greater change. And um, as kind of a final question, um, something that I often ask in these interviews is um, how has kind of um, Somalia or the presidential election been covered in mainstream media outside of Somalia, and do you find that it's accurate? Are there things that typically get overlooked or lost in this coverage? Yes, um, actually, one of the reasons why I stepped forward was to challenge uh, the global narrative of Somalia. Somalia is often uh, referred to as a failed state, you know, uh, uh, a state where you have Islamic militants running amok where people are dying of starvation, where women are subjugated and, you know, oppressed and where warlords are holding people hostages and so forth. I wanted to change that narrative and say, there are people like myself, people like me who would like to see a better Somalia. And we would like to have that balanced with the stories that are going out. Um, regarding, uh, regarding Somalia. So it's not just a tale of uh, these kind of headlines of fear and anger, it's one of hope and inspiration and the future as well. The fear is there, the anger is there, but it's one of resi resiliency, that Somalis are resilient. The country is running without a proper uh, government for, has been running for the past 26 years. I mean, this is, you know, it has the best flourishing um, economy in the Horn of Africa. Um, it has really, um, you know, a booming uh, telecommunication sector, um, agriculture. We have one of the best sea lives in, in the whole of Africa. We have gas and oil blocks. You know, Somalis are still alive. We have, uh, you know, education, we have healthcare, although, you know, it's not for all, uh, only a, a privileged few uh, able to access that. And so really, we, we, uh, I'd like to see that story balanced so that it's not always about, you know, misery and problems, but really also about the beauty of Somali people, particularly women, because this society is functioning because of women. Right. And that is something we want, you know, put out there that we are not victims, we are survivors. And right. only a survivor is able to, to be resilient and survive. And, and, and we would like to change the narrative of victimhood when we are not victims and we do not want to be disempowered by being given, uh, being given that role. And that's why I want people, you know, particularly the media, to take this story and understand that in a country like Somalia, 
with all the negative connotations attached to it, yet there's a woman running, one who is highly educated, qualified, and capable of you know, bringing in change. And so my story often when it's put out there, it's about being a refugee, about being disadvantaged, um, almost very, you know, very uh, akin to victim mode. Mm -hmm. Oh, that that uh, Muslim woman, you know, who who is who has made it, um, and there are many many others of you know similar accomplishments, and uh, who are silently also instigating social change inside the country, but who don't have that exposure. So I'd like to challenge the prevailing notion of Somalia and to say it's not the only story. There are several di you know, different stories um, coming outside of the country. Right, and highlight the perseverance and the success and the success to be had, like you uh, mentioned in your speech about how your mom would take you through these visualizations and say, this is something you can do and you will do. Yes. Um, the story of Somali women is often overlooked. Um, Somali women are actually the ones who used to fight um, for Somalia's uh, independence indirectly. They are the ones who call the men, set them around the table and said, hey, we need independence. This is how we should go about it. You don't have resources. We will sell our gold. We will sell our clothes. We will sell our you know, um, possessions so that we can have that, so that you can go um, to the United States, go somewhere else and advocate for independence. They were promised, yes, we will you know, reward you for that. And when we gained independence, they were shoved to the side, you know, uh, we will give you a chance, but wait. And, 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 and so we've been quiet throughout. The little peace that we have in Somalia, it was women who instigated that. They're the ones who convened the peace uh, talks and got the militias and all these different men to sit down. They are informally running the country. If you see them in the private sector and the public sector, they are there. What we just want is to now formalize that leadership to say, we will also sit at the highest level and take the country forward. Instead of leading it informally, we will formally also take on that uh, responsibility. And it sounds like it's, it's a perfect time for Somalia. And I'm so excited to see um, how the country progresses, um, especially with you kind of paving the way and inspiring so many um, Somali women and women globally alike. Thank you. And um, the other thing that I see with the global media is that they oftentimes talk about uh, elections in Somalia. We do not have elections in Somalia. We have what we call selections. We have um, the 4.5 clan-based apartheid system. This is very similar to the apartheid system in South Africa. It's very similar to the Hindu caste system. It's a system that is highly oppressive. It's, you know, um, it subjugates, um, it silences majority of the Somalis. It doesn't um, acknowledge women and the youth and, you know, members of, of the communities that come from uh, marginalized clans. It's a system that is premised on supremacy, as in saying that the four major clans are 100% ethnically Somalis, their blood is pure, and the point fives or the subhumans are tainted or, you know, um, are half a human being. And their eyes are in the clan system. Yes, this is the clan system that um, Western donors are funding inside the country. It's a system that shouldn't exist in the 21st century. It has no place in, in, in the civilized world. It must be dismantled. And if we want peace in Somalia and we want democracy and we want prosperity, then we must get rid of this system. This is a highly corrupt system. It's the root cause for the conflict inside the country. And so there are some entities who will use the word election to take away uh, the attention from the fact that this is a system that is actually unconstitutional. Right. It is against the Somali constitution. It's against the Somali culture. It's against you know, Islam, the religion. And so a way to stop this clan system from continuing would be for Western donors to stop funding the clan system or? Uh, what we need to do is for first the Western donors to 
change the semantics that they use. Instead of legitimizing the system, uh, we would appreciate if they would be honest and say that this is a system that is unconstitutional. It is pay based on you know a racist ideology. It is uh, based on injustice. Um, that is very important, you know, to use the proper language to describe this horrendous system. The external pressure. E exactly. The second thing is to stop funding the system because the current administration runs because the Western donors are paying their salaries. They are the ones who maintain this, uh, you know, oppressive system that causes 700 Somali youths from Somaliland and Puntland to migrate every day to the West to come to the United States, they are actually funding insecurity inside the country. And then when this young people appear in these countries, they are shocked and they are, they are wondering why they're coming here. They're coming here because the foreign policies of these countries are instigating problems inside the country. And then lastly, uh, I would like to see the taxpayers who are funding, you know, it's their money. Mm -hmm. It's that person who is working eight, you know, hours a day or more than that, and who gets, ta you know, tasked for that. They need to know how their money is being spent. Their money is being spent to cause, you know, additional conflict inside the country, to oppress 99% of the Somali population, to cause 67% of the Somali youth, you know, the population to be unemployed, for these people to migrate, for tourism to flourish inside the country. I would like them to take responsibility for how their money is being used. Right. And if this is the kind of aid that they think is appropriate, then I think Somalia does not need that aid. It can do without it. Right. And until kind of these external forces are continuing to fund um, such a corrupt system, it will kind of keep it in a vicious cycle. But it sounds like the fact that you're running for president now just speaks to the progress that's ready to be had and yes. the people's thirst for that. So I already sense that you've kind of lit a fire and people are really receptive and open to this change. And I'm very excited to see um, what change you're able to lead in the coming year. Thank you. Um, my, my candidacy actually challenges the 4.5 plan based system. I am saying that leadership should be merit based, not because you happen to be a man from a certain clan. That should not give you any rights to be in leadership. And I want to also challenge the myth of leadership, not only in Somalia, but on the continent in Africa, whereby it is associated with a 60 something year old African man with gray hair and a pot belly from a well-known family, you know, um, that, you know, that image is seen to be the only way of leading a country or, you know. And right now in America with the elections as well, exactly. that image is being seen. Exactly. And so I want us to demystify that, to say, no, you don't have to be a politician. You don't have to be a man. You don't have to be of that age. Um, even a lay person can be a politician because we are the ones who put these people into, into these offices. If they don't do what we think is, you know, appropriate, then we should challenge them. And, you know, stand them accountable. Yeah, hold them accountable, but also stand for office. Some of us will say, oh, politics is disgusting. I know I'm not a politician, but I think it is a moral, you know, duty. It's a civic, uh, right, a civic uh, civil yeah, servant. Yeah, for us to do this. And so we must step forward and reclaim leadership and reclaim our countries. Uh, for if we don't, then you will have Trump and God knows who else coming forward and uh, Mugabe and all these other people in the uh, different parts of the world. Uh, and so we must mitigate against that. And that calls for going into politics, even if it's, if it's the last thing we want to do. It's distasteful, yes. But you have no other option. Right. Well, politics needs more people like you. So thank you so much for um, throwing your hat in the ring for the presidential race. It's so inspiring to hear your story and also your vision for the future of Somalia. Thank you so much for taking the time. And everyone, I'll put more information um, on the video link below. This has been On the Map, Off the Radar from Helsinki. Bye.